our next speaker is Chris Heim, and I'll just uh, let him introduce himself, but um, I read a publication that he did is how he came to be one of our speakers. So I'm super excited that he is able to be with us. I think I'll just go ahead and let you start. Okay. Thanks. Um, and really appreciate the invitation to talk with you all today. My name is Chris Hine. I work for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I've been at NREL for about five and a half years. Prior to that, I worked for Back Conservation International, which is headquartered in Austin, Texas. Um, I actually grew up in Houston through all grade school in, in Houston. I went to Texas A&M for my bachelor's, went to Texas State University, which is um, well, it was Southwest Texas uh, State when I uh, graduated there. Now it's Texas State. And then got my PhD at the University of Georgia. Um, and I've been working on renewable energy and wildlife issues for about 17 years, uh, mostly focused on bats, but also bird um, related issues. And more recently, looking at uh, interactions between offshore wind and uh, wildlife. This presentation will be. Um, an overview of kind of what we know, what we still need to kind of figure out, how we try to quantify or understand the impact of, of wind turbines on wildlife, and then some of the strategies that we use to minimize that impact because, um, you know, we, we need renewable energy. Wind energy is very important, um, but we want to develop it in a way that doesn't impact our environment. Um, so kind of in a, a nutshell is, you know, from a, from a deployment perspective, wildlife impacts can delay development, um, can put a pause on, on project construction and operation or curtail operations. And what, what that means is, um, when you curtail a wind turbine, you're basically stopping it from spinning. Uh, and producing renewable energy. And you, and you might do that under circumstances where collision risk for birds or bats is high. Um, <clears throat> wind turbines can cause direct or indirect impacts. Direct impacts are collision events um, where the animal collides with the moving blades um, and results in fatalities, could result in injuries um, to the animal. Indirect impacts are those that might relate to habitat, um, you know, a loss of habitat or alteration of habitat where the where the site is being developed. It could result in behavioral issues uh, for the animals. So maybe they don't use an area that they normally would, and that could have um, uh, deleterious impacts on on those individuals. Um, <clears throat> the cumulative effect. So as we continue to build out wind energy more and more. You know, the effects can magnify over time and, you know, have the potential to result in population level effects. Um, and those are where we're, we're really focused on um, trying to prevent that. Uh, we don't want wind energy or really anything that we do to result in the extinction of, of wildlife. One of the challenges that we face is that there's a lack of publicly available data. Um, and so trying to really understand um, these interactions can be difficult um, when we don't have the right data to, to work from. Uh, but we do have solutions um, and strategies to mitigate the impact, which is great. Um, but not, not, all, not all sites, not all wind energy facilities require mitigation, um, but those that do, it's appropriate to apply um, what we call the mitigation hierarchy, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, <clears throat> so first, I wanted to focus on land-based wind, uh, land-based wind energy. And here, um, the three groups of animals that we're primar primarily concerned about are grouse um, species, golden eagles, and um, different species of bats. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, just going back to 2000, this this shows uh, the cumulative installation of wind energy that we have in the United States. Uh, this number is a little bit behind um, the fall of 2023, but at that time we had about 146,000 megawatts of wind energy 
which accounted for about 10% of our electricity um, in, in the U.S. And, and so that's quite a bit. Um, and there are certainly projections to to um, to achieve 30, even 50 percent of our renewal of our total energy uh, demands from wind. Um, these bar graphs represent how much um, was installed in each in any given year. And you can see that it it fluctuates over time. There are some really good years. And then there are years where not a lot of development occurs. And a lot of that has to do with um, inflation, supply chain, um, tax credits even. So it it can it can go up and down on any given year. We're kind of on a downward trend um, over the last couple of years. Um, so when we look at, at the interactions between bats and wind energy, um, <clears throat> there are two main two main issues that that come up. Um, one are so this is a this, these are maps of the U.S. with in blue are the ranges for different species of of bats, and all the little black dots are where wind energy facilities occur. So you can one see that you know in Texas, Texas leads the U.S. in the amount of installed capacity. Um, but you can see that kind of the plains region has a lot of wind. Um, Midwestern states has a lot of wind energy and then, you know, parts of the Northeast. Um, Oregon and Washington, um, right along the border, has quite a bit of wind energy. Um, and you can also see areas where there isn't any. Um, and this is because these areas where you don't see wind energy, is they tend to have lower wind speeds. And so it's not as economical to produce energy from wind in, in the Southeast, for example. Um, but that's that is changing as turbine technology improves. So we have the species ranges for bats that are listed as um, threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act, or may soon be. Um, so the Indiana bat over here, the northern long-eared bat are listed as endangered. The little brown bat and the tricolored bat are being considered. Um, but th these, these species on the top row here really aren't impacted by wind energy that much. Um, we, don't, we don't see very many fatalities of these four bats, but they are impacted by white nose syndrome, which you may have heard of, which is a fungus that um, interacts with the species when they hibernate and causes bats to um, basically dehydrate and lose their energy reserves faster. Um, and it's been very um, devastating for these species. <laughs> On the lower part of this figure, these, these four species are the bats that are vulnerable to wind energy development. So we find a lot of fatalities of these four species um, at wind energy facilities, um, but they're not protected. Um, and so there are, no, there are no federal or state laws um, um, to offer any sort of conservation protection for these four bats. Um, so sadly, um, the estimates of fatality um, for these four bats mainly um, is in the hundreds of thousands per year. Um, we found a total of um, 27 different species of bats under wind, um, as fatalities under wind turbines. Um, and again, those four that I showed make up 80% of those fatalities. And so, for example, the hoary bat, which is the species here, makes up about 32% of fatalities. The eastern red bat, um, 24%, and then uh, silver hair bat and Brazilian free tail bat make up 16 and 10% respectively. Um, let's see. What we know about these fatalities is um, they occur at a, at a certain time of the year. So they don't occur year round. Um, the late summer and early fall is when we see most of the fatalities. So Roughly 15 July through 15 October is when we see the highest fatalities for bats. And this, this occurs during fall migration. Um, it also occurs at the time when these bats are mating. So something about those two life cycle events for these bats makes them more susceptible, vulnerable um, to collisions with wind turbines. We also know that um, Weather conditions play a role. So 
during this period of time when the wind speeds are relatively low and temperatures are really high, um, we see more collision events than um, say at higher wind speeds or colder temperatures. And um, one of the things that has made this really challenging is we, we find that for some reason, these bats appear to be attracted to wind turbines. So um, we use thermal cameras. So this is a thermal camera image. The camera is pointing straight up at a wind turbine. So here's the tower of the turbine. Here's where the, the generator is, um, the hub or the nacelle, and, and uh, here is one of the blades. So we use these thermal cameras to observe bats flying around and interacting with wind turbines. Um, here's a, a map of just one individual and its flight path, this kind of curved flight path, um, over a 10-minute period, just, you know, flying in and around the wind turbine, flying um, between the blades. We're not really sure why they spend all this time around wind turbines. There are a couple of theories, um, but they appear to not recognize that they're at risk. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to understand is this behavior. Why, why are they approaching wind turbines? Why are they spending so much time around um, and putting themselves at risk? And if we can understand that, we, um, you know, we might be able to find a solution or improve our existing solutions. Uh, when we look at eagles, um, the golden eagle in particular, which is, um, protected under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, this is a range map of the e of golden eagles in different times of the year. Um, they do occur across the U.S., um, but this western population, um, which is in, in purple here for the most part, they seem to be more susceptible to collisions than elsewhere across the country. Uh, we're not really sure why that is at this point. Um, <clears throat> one of the challenges with golden eagles is there's there's really not that many of them. And so any fatality event, regardless of the, the case, whether it's wind energy or something else, um, has more of an influence on its population than animals that have a large population size. So they have a small population size. Um, the reproductive rate is low, only one or two chicks per year. And so um, it takes a long time to recover from any sort of sustained um, impact on a population. One thing that raptors, not just eagles, but all raptors use um, in order to gain lift and gain height when they're flying is um, thermal lifts where the heat of um, the day, the heat, heat rising from the surface creates air currents. And so you might see vultures or eagles kind of just spiraling up, gaining height, and they use those um, as a way to conserve energy so they don't have to flap their wings. They can just open up their wings and, and uh, use these thermal lifts. The other type of lift that they use is orographic lift. And this is when wind, wind um, going across the landscape comes across a mountain or a hill and is forced up. And so raptors will use that orographic lift uh, to gain altitude as well. And this orographic lift um, also creates really good conditions for wind energy. And so a lot of the times where we see, see interactions with eagles and uh, wind turbines is at this interface where turbines might be on the ridgeline and eagles are using that same airspace um, to gain altitude. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's really interesting, and I'll go to the next slide here, is that raptors have a bald spot on top of their head. Um, not a bald spot, sorry, a blind spot. And so when a raptor is soaring through the air, looking down on the ground, say for prey items, for rodents, they can't see what's in front of them. And so if there's a wind energy facility that they're, they just happen to be flying through, they're focused on the ground. They, they're not even aware um, of what's in front of them. And they're not expecting anything to be in the airspace that, that would result in a collision. And so 
this is different than what I was talking about with bats, where they tend to fly in and around the wind turbines quite a bit. Raptors don't. Um, so their collisions may just be, you know, for the most part, it's just bad luck um, that they're flying in the airspace um, occupied by wind turbines and, and not really even aware of it. <clears throat> when we look at grouse species, um, the two main grouse species that um, are most concerning are the greater sage grouse, which occurs across several western states, and the lesser prairie chicken, which um, does have part of the range in, in northern Texas. Um, these two species, for the most part, and other grouse species, um, their main challenge is loss of habitat. Um, and so really any kind of development that reduces our habitat or degrades our habitat um, is going to affect these species. And so this would, uh, going back to the first slide, this would be, you know, what I mentioned as indirect impact where um, their habitat is removed or they're disturbed by the construction. They're kind of uh, very skittish birds. They don't like a lot of disturbance. Uh, and so Human, the presence of humans, presence of construction can displace them from areas where they would normally um, either nest or forage um, and reduce their reproductive rate. So maybe they're not they're not producing as many chicks each year or maybe not even nesting if they're removed from a habitat that they would normally be in. And we have a, a lot of evidence that human activities um, has this kind of negative indirect effect on grouse. There's actually mixed results on whether wind energy um, results in the same effects. So in some studies, we see no um, impact to um, the birds, and in others, we do. So we're, that makes it complicated uh, when you get kind of mixed results. So we're not really sure why in some situations there's an impact and in others there's not. Um, and the best way for... for um, Kind of resolving this issue or mitigating the issue is to really protect the habitat, and and you can do that in a number of ways um, uh, through mitigation. Um, so preserving their habitat, maybe in other areas, um, uh, is a, is a good way to to help these species. Um, okay, a little bit about offshore wind. Um, offshore wind energy is really new to the U.S. It has a it has a, a long history in Europe. Um, for decades, they've been producing offshore wind energy, but it is new for us. Um, we only have a few wind turbines um, off of the Atlantic uh, coast, um, but um, that's changing really rapidly. Um, the, the, the current administration has a goal of producing 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Um, so that's that's not too far away. Um, and these maps here show where wind energy is expected um, for um, first the Atlantic coast. This is where most of the, the construction is occurring right now. Um, the, um, where is it? The vineyard wind farm. So this orange stretch has, um, this one actually became operational. They're still constructing, but there's a few turbines that became operational producing electricity uh, just recently in January, and same with um, this kind of teal color, the South Fork Wind Farm. Um, but all of these others um, are expected to be developed um, across the 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 Atlantic. There are <clears throat> wind energy areas on the Pacific Coast, so in um, Southern California here, Northern California, and then. Um, there's these two locations off the coast of Oregon that are also anticipated. And then um, closer to where you all are, um, the Gulf of Mexico is anticipated to have wind energy um, both um, in Texas and then off of, of Louisiana. And these are just two of the first uh, wind energy areas that have been proposed um, there are others that are anticipated, but um, it's 
several years out before um, any any wind is uh, will be developed in the Gulf of Mexico, but it'll start in, in these two areas. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple different ways to secure or stabilize offshore wind energy. Um, one is monopiles and, and these, you, you basically hammer them into the ocean floor. Uh, there's what are called jackets. Um, and again, you, you kind of pile drive these into the, into the ocean floor as well. There's a couple different type of jacket um, structures that can be used. Um, and these, these types of foundations, um, they're often called fixed bottom foundations, are intended for shallow, relatively shallow water, so 50 meters. And so in a lot of cases on the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico, this is the, one of these types of foundations will be used. As you get into deeper waters, um, um, mostly on the Pacific coast, um, floating platforms or floating foundations will be used um, where there's some sort of um, floating component and then mooring lines that anchor the um, structure to the ocean floor. Uh, and there's a couple different ways that, that you can go about doing that. So there's um, a lot of research going into how to best secure wind turbines um, and um, reduce reduce the overall impact, reduce the, the amount of materials that are needed. Um, you can imagine that there's a lot of concrete and metal that's required um, for fixed bottom foundations and for mooring lines. Um, so always looking at costs and making things cheaper is, is important. Um, <clears throat> When we look at the impacts of offshore wind energy, wind energy to wildlife, um, they can certainly impact bats and birds, um, um, shorebirds, gulls, terns, um, pelicans. You know, some of the birds that you see off the coast um, are of concern. Several different bat species. So, and displacement, or both, both the direct and indirect. Uh, impacts that I mentioned apply. But when we think about um, uh, animals under the under the surface of the water, um, a couple of different things can happen. One is, you know, the the infrastructure that's below the surface will eventually accumulate wildlife. Um, all sorts of invertebrates, um, corals and clams and so forth. And as they get established, they create a food source for fish, um, different fish species, which then may bring in uh, predator species like sharks um, or dolphins. And so it can create an artificial reef, which could be a, a very good thing. Um, <clears throat> there's also disturbance effects uh, under the surface of the water and potentially lethal effects that can occur um, that I'll, I'll talk about here. Um, <clears throat> so. One of the, the biggest concerns for offshore wind uh, related to wildlife are on marine mammals and turtles because all of these species are protected. Uh, turtles are listed under the Endangered Species Act and marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And the construction noise, pile driving these poles or the jackets into the ocean surface can create noise that can be anywhere from um, annoying or disturbing to the animals to causing actual physiological effects and lethal effects. And so <clears throat> pile driving activities, construction activities um, need to keep an eye out for animals in the area. Um, and so as whales migrate up and down the coast, um, there are certain periods of time when whales will be present you don't want to do your pile driving. And then as they migrate through, you have windows to proceed with the construction activities without endangering um, those species. Um, vessel traffic, for, for any reason, um, whether it's the development or maintenance of wind energy facilities or um, shipping, can lead to collisions with whales. And so, um, you know, as vessel traffic might increase, for the construction of a wind energy facility, it's important to 
maintain proper ship speeds, keep um, what they call, you know, um, biomonitors or, or observers um, on the lookout for potential whales um, that could result in a collision in front of the ship. Um, and then the last one that um, is a potential concern for uh, floating wind is entanglement. So um, this, this image down here shows the kind of the relative scale of a, you know, in this case, what would be a tiny little humpback whale relative to the size of the mooring lines, um, the transmission line. This is kind of an uh, interarray, what they call an interarray um, transmission line from one turbine to the next. Primary entanglement would be if the whale were to get entangled with um, either the transmission or the mooring lines. And that's likely rare. Um, what is more likely is what they call secondary entanglement, and that is where all the garbage, the, the um, derelict nets, fishing nets, might accumulate across these mooring lines, and then an animal would get entangled into that, um, that debris. Um, and so there's... There's um, efforts to look at how do we maintain these mooring lines, these transmission lines to keep them free of debris. Um, you know, do we do use submersibles to to monitor them and to remove debris? Um, so that, that to me, that's kind of interesting how we might go about monitoring um, and keeping clean these mooring lines. Um, for fish and invertebrates, um, you know, the construction activities. Cables um, on the on the seafloor might cause this habitat disturbance. Um, there's also a concern about the electromagnetic fields that transmission cables may um, cause uh, certain species of fish, um, particularly sharks. There are lobsters, different invertebrate species are sensitive to electromagnetic fields that may cause behavioral changes um, or effects for these animals if they're close to the cables. These electromagnetic fields don't dissipate very far um, or are not as intense very far from the cable. So um, it's more of a localized effect. Um, there's also the potential for the colonization of invasive species, um, particularly if you're in a, say, a, a kind of muddy substrate, the ocean floor is more muddy or sandy um, kind of soft bottom ocean floor, and you put a very hard substrate in the water, that might accumulate species that wouldn't normally be there. Um, and then that can cause um, changes to the, the food web uh, in the area. And then I already, I already talked about artificial reefs, which would, would be a, a, a benefit of, of um, when in installation in the uh, in the offshore environment. Okay, so talked about some of the the bad stuff, the the interactions of wildlife um, with wind energy. Now I want to just mention a little bit about what we can do about it. Um, and so I, I talked about the mitigation hierarchy, which you you may have heard before. It's basically a, a systematic process um, where you First, try to avoid any sort of negative impact. What you can't avoid, you try to minimize, and what you can't minimize, you compensate or offset. And so um, if we look at it with respect to biodiversity um, and you have a proposed project that you know is gonna cause an effect, a negative effect on biodiversity, through proper planning, you might be able to avoid maybe half of those if you were to site your project in a certain area um, or construct um, your site, you know, when whales aren't present, say. Um, but you, you're not able to reduce all of those negative impacts. So then you go to minimization strategies. And then, you know, you, you're reducing your impact. And then what you can't minimize, you compensate for. So if you're going to disturb habitat, say two square miles of habitat, 
you might compensate by protecting two square miles of, of very similar habitat in another location. So that at the very end, we actually achieve a, a net gain in biodiversity. Um, that would be the best case scenario. And so um, <clears throat> avoidance is really just kind of siting and, and how we how we think about where we're going to place construction areas or wind energy facilities um, and, and maybe not putting them in sensitive habitat or in areas where there's uh, that's very important for wildlife. Minimization is more about, OK, we, we put the facility in place. How are we going to reduce, say, collision events for birds and bats? And there's some really cool technology that's used uh, for this or, or, or different strategies to reduce um, the impact of, of wind turbines on wildlife. Um, one is to use um, on this top left here um, a, ca a camera based system. So this this is a technology called Identiflight. It has a bunch of different cameras that can see 360 degrees. Um, and when it's used for eagles. And so when it detects an eagle approaching a, a wind turbine, or a set of turbines, it can inform the controls of those turbines um, to have them curtail or to have them stop spinning. And so the eagle can pass through the area um, safely. And then once the eagle passes, it allows the wind turbines to turn back on. Uh, another technology for, for eagles and raptors is, well, it's not really a technology, but a strategy is to make the turbine more obvious to the animals. And so um, there has been one study in a, that's been completed and a couple more underway looking at painting at least one of the blades black. And so as it's spinning in the, in the air, it's just a little more obvious. Um, and maybe the animal sees that and reacts to it differently, avoiding the collision event. Um, and this has had some success. For bats, one of the technologies that's used, um, these are ultrasonic uh, deterrents. So bats navigate and forage using sonar, uh, very similar to what whales and dolphins use. And so if you emit a frequency um, in, in their range, in their um, sonar range, it can, dis it can disrupt their ability to navigate or find prey and create basically an annoying area for them. And so they won't want to occupy the space where the sound is emitted. Um, bats, their, their sonar is above our hearing range. And so these deterrent noises are above our hearing range. So it doesn't create any um, additional noise that might disturb humans. Uh, lastly on the slide, um, technologies to reduce the amount of noise created during pile driving events. Um, these are called bubble curtains. And so you basically place um, this technology, this disc around the area where you're going to pile drive and it creates bubbles. It just shoots bubbles out of the air or sorry, um, into the water column. And the noise is buffeted. The noise and pressure differential is buffeted by these um, these bubbles. And so it limits the amount of um, harmful noise that's uh, transmitted in the surrounding area. So that's a pretty neat um, solution for reducing noise during construction activities. Um, yeah, just a couple more slides here. Um, so looking forward, as, as we think about where we are right now with wind energy and where we might be in the very near term, we have to think about you know, what's that gonna mean for, for wildlife species and some of the challenges that we're currently facing? Um, we know wind energy is going to expand, it's gonna go into new areas. And so we have to be cognizant of that. Uh, oops, I forgot the percentage. But as I mentioned earlier, we, we are currently producing 10% of our energy from wind. Uh, we have projections um, to produce 20% of our our energy by uh, from wind by 2030 and up to 35 percent by 2050. So, um, you know, this this isn't too far away. We're we're planning to double and even triple our amount of wind energy capacity. 
for land-based wind, um, we had, a, I, I mentioned this in megawatts earlier, 140,000 megawatts of wind, that's 146 gigawatts uh, with projections um, of up to 240 by 2030 and 400 by, um, oops, uh, sorry, that was supposed to be 2050. And then in the offshore, um, we currently have 45 megawatts, but um, we have goals of 30 gigawatts by 2030, 40 by 2040, and then 100 gigawatts by 2050. So um, a lot of activity, a lot of new wind in the area. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that um, wind turbines are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the average wind turbine in 2019 had 120 meter uh, diameter. Um, roughly the size of a, a football field. Um, by 2035, that might be um, go from 120 meters to 174 meters. Um, I think this is even on the low end. Um, so they're getting bigger. And offshore is already um, bigger than what we see um, onshore. So um, we have to we have to think about as turbines change, what does that mean? Do we have, does that equate to more interactions, the same amount of interactions, less interactions? We're not really sure. Um, and so what can we do? We need to implement the mitigation hierarchy um, during our phases of development. We need to accelerate the pace of research so that we can keep up with our deployment scenarios. Um, and, and develop solutions um, that can be used faster. Um, wildlife research is always behind development. Um, uh, that mostly it just takes time to you know study the situation and really have an understanding of it. Um, but technology and, and deployment just keeps on going. Um, we need to keep up with the pace and the dimensions of turbine technology. Um, the one really nice thing about studying this is that there are a lot of people involved, um, state and federal governments, non-governmental organizations. The industry um, has been really helpful in trying to resolve these issues, research institutions, universities. And um, we all bring different experience, skills, um, backgrounds to this. From, from engineering to atmospheric sciences to biology to try to resolve this issue. Um, and so that's really nice to see. And then, you know, as with anything, we need to be creative and flexible and, and think about different ways to approach this um, and not kind of get in our own little silos. Um, lastly, I'll just mention, if, if you are interested in this, um, in wind energy and wildlife, this website here um, uh, is maintained by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and funded through the Department of Energy. And it, it has a database of all the articles and publications that relate to wind energy and wildlife, both for land-based and offshore wind, um, and a lot of good resources. And some of the resources are more on the educational side um, and others are more you know, on the really in the weeds, um, scientific publications, peer-reviewed publications, but there are webinars, there are short little two to three page research briefs. So yeah, just a resource if it's something that you wanna learn more about. With that, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chris, that was fascinating. I do have a question, why are the wind turbines getting bigger? You think they'd be getting smaller and more efficient? So that's that's a really good question. Um, the bigger they get, they can capture energy from a larger area, and there are more. The higher you go, the more stable the wind is, and so the more consistent it is, as opposed to wind speeds coming up and down. The st stable winds just allow you to produce more energy at a constant um, rate, and so you can you can. It's less volatile, I guess, from an energy production, from a revenue kind of perspective. Um, and so 
yeah, they just <laughs> they just keep getting bigger and bigger. That's disappointing. I thought they would get smaller. <laughs> Because um, I mean, I've seen some of these in um in Southwest Virginia, where mm -hmm. I'm from Virginia, and it's just it really takes away from the landscape, I think. And I just, you know, wish they would get smaller. <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, and you touched on a whole other set of challenges with um kind of the social component of wind, the human dimension component of wind energy. Um the view the view shed the the noise the um yeah so that is a whole whole other set of research and conversations and people involved and it's um and, and important as well well i have a question um i've driven to california and been through wind farms i've been up north texas through very dense wind farms when when they're so dense what chance does any bat or eagle have? Don't you think density has a big impact on the wildlife? Absolutely. I, I, I think you're right on that. Um, and we haven't, uh, that hasn't really been explored. Well, we, we uh, at, at our current kind of development, what we have looked at is future deployment scenarios and how we might from a kind of from the, the industry deployment energy side uh, configure our, our future wind installation. So we could build fewer but larger facilities kind of on one end or smaller but more uh, facilities. And what is that right? What's the best matrix from a from an energy perspective, and how will those different scenarios influence wildlife? Um, but yeah, if you've got North Texas, this is a perfect example where there are probably thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of wind turbines. There are. Yeah. Um, and, and there's certainly some areas similar to that. Um, it, it does seem like a gauntlet, right, As for, for migrating wildlife. Um, I didn't mention this. I mentioned the timing with bats, but not for birds. So, songbirds can also be, um, can also collide with wind turbines. Uh, and the timing is very similar. So it's really, the, the time of year um, seems to be a really important factor in all of this. And um, you know, perhaps shutting down wind turbines during times of the year under very specific conditions um, can help reduce that, um, that, that fatality. But it also comes with producing less energy. So it really is a trade-off, uh, a balancing act of meeting our, our growing energy demands and protecting our wildlife. And, and we, we have to do both. Yeah. Um, when they get bigger and taller and they get up to that more stable air, are they effective at night? Is there, isn't there a lot less wind at night? Uh, it, it depends on where you are um, and the time of year. Um, so um, in some locations, daytime is, is better. Some locations, nighttime is better. Some, and in many cases, you know, that, day switching tonight um the you know around sunset uh can be really good and then d depending on where you are the seasons can be influential so um yeah there's 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 a lot that goes into the development side that i'm <clears throat> you know that's not my area but as as um developers are planning an area they'll they'll put out what they're called meteorological towers and have weather systems at different heights to kind of get a sense of what the annual wind speed is and how it changes over time uh, to help determine if that's the best place for them or say it's a good place, say a certain area is a good place, where is the best place to put individual wind turbines? Thank you. I do have some questions about the bats and turbines also. Um, as I mentioned, the, the forced 
I'm sorry, the turbine density in bat collisions, but bats can fly through forests and relatively quickly too. Maybe that's kind of a learned behavior that may take some time, but the fact that they're doing multiple flyovers, there's got to be something luring them there, whether it's a frequency or a food resource to a tower light or a, an aroma, or they're having fun surfing on the wind. Something's got to lure them there. And then also with that turbine and the paint, does that disrupt the momentum, that angular momentum being a little bit different? Because weight's got some, or paint has some good weight to it too, correct? Yeah. Um, so regarding the paint, the, to paint a turbine blade, the paint on a turbine blade, I found out, is about 600 pounds. And so when you are only doing it to one, does it does it wobble more? Does it have more of a strain on the bearings? That's something that needs to be figured out. If it was done at the factory, and you're just painting this blade black as opposed to white, that's one solution. But we don't know if that needs to happen, so it's not happening on, on a big scale. The other challenge is the thermal thermal properties of the blade. So a dark color is going to absorb more light, heat, and that may expand the blade and cause damage to the blade maybe sooner than normal. So again, it's kind of like a trade-off. One, we need to find out if this you know, works, and if it does, how do we implement it in a safe economical fashion uh for bats and attraction three of the four species that i mentioned that make up most of the fatalities are they roost in trees and so and the trees that they select for tend to be tall the tallest biggest trees in the area and so the presence of turbines from you know as a bat's flying through the landscape they may look like a tree you know from a certain distance and so that may bring them to the turbine, what keeps them flying around? Maybe they're confused. Maybe they're trying to find a place to um, to roost. Uh, maybe there's insects. So it's likely no one thing, and it's likely it could vary by species. It could vary by habitat, um, and and there could be a lot of different interactions going on at different scales. Um, so yeah, it's it. To me, that's one of the most fascinating things. I really like the bat behavior component of this and trying to understand what it is that they're doing, um, why they would approach and stay around wind turbines. Um, and it's, yeah, we're still trying to figure it out. Thank you. So when the, um, the, when the wind turbines go up, is there some, I don't want to say an agency, but is there there's some regulation about all of these things where they can go and do they have to pass any kind of, you know, is there any regulation on it? There, there quite a bit um, and, and different types of regulation. So there are setbacks from roads, cities, infrastructure, um, human development that, that these turbines have to be. There are um, FAA regulations regarding height, how many have to have lights on top of them, what do those lights look like, um, setbacks from certain um, natural features, rivers and, and things like that. So th there are some kind of environmental um, regulations. Um, there are regulations with respect to eagles and where eagle eagles nest. So these these sites before they're constructed will do biological studies. They'll do searches for eagles, what type of bats are in the area, birds are in the area, so forth. And so, yeah, yeah to answer your question, yeah, there, there are some considerations uh, for the development. Um, and then if there is, they also do studies after the fact. So the, the site's constructed, you do what are called mortality searches. So you you have a crew of people that go out and search, sadly, for, for birds and, and bats on the ground. Um, and if an endangered species is um, detected, then you have to um, take action to do something to minimize the impact under the federal, uh, under the Endangered Species Act. So you work with Fish and Wildlife Service and state agencies to figure out what's the best approach. And that, that'll vary from site to site. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, I, I have a question. <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm wondering if, if there is anything that um, either you or at, at the larger level um, that is being done in terms of where these are located with relation to the populations. Uh, and that I'm talking about there are certain places or certain things that happen, and they're normally placed in um, in low SES areas or areas that may, like you mentioned one of you about not looking very pretty, uh, or aesthetically pleasing. Well, sometimes that ends up being in other locations. Uh, is there anything that you all consider in terms of where those are positioned? I don't, um, but I know that there's the um, the companies will go and talk to the local community about the presence of when you know hey we're we're interested in this area what are your concerns um are you open to it are you opposed to it opposed to it um and you know that can vary there there's uh the, the, you might hear the the phrase not in my backyard or nimby um, and so there's, you know, understandably, um, people, they don't want it on their property. They don't want to see it in their view shed. Um, and so I, I think there's an a, an effort made to do this with community support. Um, but you're never, you're not always going to please everybody. And And given the setbacks, one of the things that's, I think is kind of unfortunate is the these facilities for the most part are really a, far away from where they're sending their power to. And so you have to create or connect to the grid or create new transmission lines, which can also cause disturbance. Um, there's an inefficiency in transmitting power from say Pennsylvania, that's going to go to New York city or way in the panhandle of Texas that's going to go to Dallas, right? So there's um, there's just there's just a lot of different challenges that go into where these are sited. Um, and and I only know, you know, kind of a little bit. So I really, uh, I don't know if I was very helpful in answering your question, but um, um, yeah. Um, it, it is. And and I, I wonder again, because we, we talked about the mortality of animals. Obviously, that's part of the environment. But we also live in an ecosystem that it also involves people mm -hmm. and communities and communities that are don't normally have a voice in where these things go. Um, so I'm trying to see what are we doing to mitigate exactly that, the challenges of the social components and the environmental one. Y yeah, absolutely. Um, and just like I kind of study the the wildlife side of it, um, there are social science scientists and community um, oriented researchers that study this as well and and try to understand and not not on behalf of the industry, but just really understanding the dynamic that occurs and how can we do this in a in a better way? Because there are so many times when just like you're you're suggesting it's like things are just we don't have a say they're just there <laughs> this development is going to occur we're going to lose this park we're going to lose this landscape because we need wind or shopping center or whatever the case may be um but yeah it, it's just not my area of of uh, focus thank you i appreciate it well we definitely want to thank you this was a fascinating talk. Um, I learned a lot. I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, I hope sometime you can get out to the Texas Marathon and join us in person. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And I hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone.